I will introduce the rest of the panel in just a second, but what I'd like to do first is really set the context for this conversation so we've all got the same kind of grounding in what we're trying to accomplish here. So in the purpose-built communities world, when you are a community quarterback, on the educational side of things, you are really focused on a neighborhood school solution. By definition, you work in a community where there are specific schools and they are almost always some of the lowest performing schools in a city district or even in the state at times. And your job as a community quarterback is to try to come up with an effective solution to change the trajectory of those neighborhood schools. Now, many of us care deeply and passionately about whole sort of education reform, and we want to see all schools succeed. But to be very clear about this conversation, when you've got your purpose-built communities hat on, your focus is much more narrow than that. And it's not like you don't care about all kids across the district, but your solutions, by definition, are neighborhood school solutions. Now, as a community quarterback person, when you're looking at your neighborhood schools, which are underperforming, realistically, what are your choices in how you can get to better educational outcomes? And honestly, there's really two, way, two ways you can approach this. It's not a very big toolkit. You can go the charter school route, or you can try to work with the district to improve the schools that already exist. That's it. It's a binary equation. And while the calculus of which way you go and the thought process is a little more complicated than this, it frequently boils down to this. Charter schools have the benefit of putting control in your hands you have the most direct impact on those outcomes that you're trying to change. You have freedom, flexibility, and autonomy, and that's wonderful. On the other hand, they're expensive. You've got to come up with a facility solution. They're politically difficult in many jurisdictions. And then many times they set up a system of winners and losers because you're bringing a new school into a community where schools are already serving kids. On the, tradition, on the route of trying to partner with traditional public schools, with the schools that are already there, on the positive side, many of us philosophically really want to work with school districts. We believe in traditional neighborhood schools, and we want to partner to get things done. But on the other hand, it's really hard to figure out a meaningful way to have an impact in most partnership opportunities. There are honestly very few examples of effective partnerships with traditional public school districts, and there's very few examples of meaningful roles that an outside entity like a community quarterback can play. So that's the context for this conversation, and the good news is, is that what we have today is an example of a partnership with a public school district that actually works and maybe even better news, it works right here in Omaha. So our panel today are, represent the four parties, if you will, that make this kind of partnership work. And so we'll let everybody, we'll do quick introductions here. We'll start at the far end with Sydney Franklin, who's the senior program officer at the community quarterback organization here, 75 North. And Sydney, can you tell a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Sydney Franklin. Uh, I'm 75 North uh, Senior. Thank you, uh, Senior Program Director. Welcome to Omaha. For those of you that are not from uh, the city, um, I'm from Omaha. I've lived across the country, um, and so I've gotten to see some other um, uh, similar and diverse cities. And, and so I'm just really uh, excited and proud uh, to do this work. And uh, hopefully, we'll offer some good insights for other. Uh, either quarterback agencies or potential uh, future purpose-built quarterback um, agencies uh, that are looking for insights and resources and kind of a, a, a tool guide uh, for this type of work. Great. And next to Sydney is Melissa Combine. Melissa is now the Chief Academic Officer at Omaha Public Schools. 
at the relevant time during most of what you're, you will hear today. She was way more directly involved as the executive director uh, and the boss of the next person we'll introduce. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Melissa Comine, and I was born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska, and currently reside in the city with my family. So I'm very connected to the city of Omaha, but also the Omaha Public Schools, where I've been employed for 20 years. I've had various positions. Started as a classroom teacher, was an instructional facilitator, assistant principal, principal in a couple different buildings. As Greg mentioned, an executive director of elementary school support, and for today's conversation, specifically in the role in supporting Kennedy in this partnership. And then currently this year, I'm the new chief academic officer for our district. So Thanks. welcome. And next to Melissa is Tony Gunter. Tony's the principal at Howard Kennedy Elementary School. Hello, you know, I think Othello introduced me as Rios yesterday. Um, that is my given name, but I've been in a, born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, been in OPS for over 20 years as well. And we actually taught together um, in elementary school. And I once was her boss. And paid, How did no. that work out? Much better. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of stories behind that. Um, but, you know, I, like I, said, I grew up in North Omaha. Uh, my, my mom, she's still down there, and myself. And, you know, it's really, uh, I'm really humbled to be a part of this uh, revitalization. And I've been at uh, Howard County for three years. My first year was uh, like a residency that we'll probably talk about a little bit more earlier and uh, later. But um, this is my second year of getting things started. So, welcome. Thank you. And then next to me is Catalina Sabilski, my colleague at Purpose Built Schools. She's the Director of Instruction for Purpose Built Schools. Good morning, everyone. I am based in Atlanta with Greg, and uh, my work is mainly around working with the principals and the school-based teens and the districts that are trying to implement the DREW model. My background is in um, Atlanta Public Schools predominantly in the central office working on leadership development and then as a principal there. All right, well we want to, we're going to have a conversation about what it took to get this partnership going and then why it's successful now. We are trying to be useful and practical to folks in the audience. So we encourage you to hold us to that standard in the last 15 minutes of this conversation we'll have Q&A. So as questions come up, hold those and, and we'll uh, address those at the end. But let's start out, Sydney, let's start out with you and talk about there's a process to getting to this partnership and then there's a substance about what this partnership is. Can you tell us a yeah. little bit about how we got here? Sure. Um, so the reason that a purpose-built community exists in Omaha and, and the reason that 75 North is committed and, and invested um, in the Highlander neighborhood are, are pretty obvious to anyone with any familiarity with the neighborhood. Um, there are uh, too many people in our community living at or below the poverty level and in substandard homes. Um, there are um, in a city that has really super low unemployment, we have far too high of unemployment. Um, kind of things that all of us expect where we live, like you know, beautiful safe roads to walk on, uh, green space, parks, um, staples like grocery stores, um, kind of are absent from the neighborhood that we serve. And then probably most importantly, the children in our community um, aren't receiving or don't have access to the kind of enriching and quality educational experience that all of us want for our children and all of us just expect. Um, and so that's kind of the starting place. I think for any purpose-built community member or any perspective, that's kind of the baseline. That's the starting place. So back in 2012, when we started working with purpose-built communities, we were doing a bunch of things. Um, finalizing and organizing purchase agreements uh, to buy land, um, to build homes on. We were thinking through a strategy uh, to bring um, health and wellness uh, to our neighborhood. But probably the, probably the biggest challenge was figuring out the education piece. We get a lot of um, kind of press and people want to know about uh, what we call the sexy part of our job, which is what you saw yesterday, the, the, the development, um, the homes, the accelerator building, all of those things. But the hard piece, probably the most challenging piece, is getting the education part right. So Purpose Built was really integral in that piece. Um, you saw Howard Kennedy Elementary School yesterday. It sits um, about four blocks from our kind of main development site, which is um, opposite from uh, how Drew Charter School uh, functions uh, within Eastlake. For anyone that's been there, it's really the centerpiece of the neighborhood. 
Um, everything else extends beyond that. Here we're not afforded that luxury, um, but uh, we, we manage. Um, for those of you that, that know the community, you know that there are five elementary schools uh, within a couple mile radius of our development site. So in 2012, when we were doing those other things, preparing um, to you know, um, implement our you know, form of the purpose-built model, uh, we were thinking through where to start with education. And unfortunately, those um, five adjacent elementary schools at the time all kind of underperformed similarly. Um, so we had the challenge of um, identifying where to start. We took the latter option when Greg mentioned the two approaches um, to education for a network member or the charter school route um, or working with the public um, school district. Um, legislatively, we aren't allowed uh, to have charter schools in Nebraska, so we took uh, the, the, the latter option. Um, after conversations, meetings, tours of the schools, it was, a, it was a process. We decided that we would work in Howard Kennedy Elementary School um, because of its adjacency and also because it had uh, the greatest need and, and the, the biggest um, challenge. So that was kind of um, our starting place there. Uh, several starts and stops that we can, that we can talk about. Um, since 2012, there have been four Omaha Public School uh, District superintendents. Now, technically, one of them never started the job because of uh, some controversy. <laughs> okay, don't get distracted. <laughs> um, because of the e email, uh, email controversy. Um, um, but from 2012, technically, till today, we've had uh, uh, four o OPS uh, school superintendents. Um, in 2013, uh, the state legislature uh, passed a bill to reduce the size of the school board from 12 to 9. And then all of those school board members had to rerun for their seats. So lots of change. Um, and again, lots of starts and stops. And so, to be frank, um, we were kind of wading through and dealing with uh, some change and instability within those the board level and also with the, the at the superintendent level. So, um, pause for one second. So, where where did the first conversations take place? I mean, you know, you want to do something. You want you picked yeah. out which school. How how do you get somebody's attention? Yeah, at, at the, the and so level? all of that takes place at the leadership level within OPS, talking with folks like Melissa Colmine. Yeah. Uh, we were really fortunate in 2013 when uh, Mark Evans. I don't know if he's here. He's the current OPS superintendent. Came on board, um, and it took a few months. But once he kind of settled in and got his bearings about him, we were able to really get to work and put together a plan of action to move this um, this idea that we had really transforming. Howard Kennedy using um, what Tony will discuss are these um, elements that we've essentially stolen from Jew Charter School and Atlanta and embedded and implemented them in Howard Kennedy Elementary School. So it was really, um, we have to uh, thank uh, the leadership uh, under Mark Evans um, that started in 2013. Um, and then we'll get into it in 2015, uh, a really unique and groundbreaking um, community partnership agreement was established between 75 North and Omaha Public Schools to reconstitute Howard Kennedy. And so I know we'll get into that, but that's kind of the framework for today's discussion, how we got to where we are today. So let me just highlight a couple things. So the, the conversation started literally at the superintendent level, or were there conversations before that? Yeah, so 75 North, it, it, any community quarterback can talk to you about the work that you do at the ground level, talking with um, folks in schools, teachers, leaders, deans, um, parents, community members, all of that is kind of taking place simultaneously while we're talking to the district leadership to really come up with a, a plan and an approach uh, to, to, to tackle the challenges at Howard Kennedy. All right. And did you, so good transition point, did you have a fully baked idea of what you wanted to happen or is that a conversation between OPS and you over time? Sure. So we're really fortunate to have the expertise and the experience that Purpose Built communities and, and now purpose-built schools has. And so um, I think the, the, the idea was that um, we, can, we would come to OPS with a plan in place, but be flexible enough um, to accommodate what is kind of existing at Howard Kennedy. So I think having that little bit of fluidity, but coming in with something solid was really integral to our approach. So Melissa, when did you get plugged into these sorts of conversations, negotiations? So I think it's important to reiterate what Sydney had said. We had went through a, quite a few years. We had a superintendent that was there for 14 years, and that's where the conversations had started. And then we went through a transition year where we had an interim, and then when Mr. Evans took over, the conversations became more frequent. Um, I think it's important to highlight that our superintendent was actively committed 
to doing this, and then our Board of Education was also, also actively committed to doing this, and um, actually had a unanimous vote 9-0 um, to approve this work that we're doing with purpose-built schools and purpose-built communities. And so then after we had some conversations, um, and even before the vote, I should go back a year before the vote, we started having a lot of conversations with community, all the district office, offices at our, we're a large district, we have 52, 53,000 students. And so our district office can be pretty difficult to navigate through just because we are so large. And so I would say about a year before the board approved to partner with 75 North, we had monthly discussions. And then in between those monthly discussions with almost every department at our district was represented. Because if we were going to move forward, and we had a pretty good idea that we wanted to move forward because we had the need. The school was not performing well. It was one of our lowest performing schools and it was also in the bottom 5% across the state of Nebraska. And we also knew that the school, as Sydney had mentioned, resided in a very poor area and there wasn't any opportunity for our students or families to grow, live, and be successful. And so we made sure that every single department was represented at the district level during those monthly meetings. And that was important for me as the executive director at that time was because I knew one day this partnership was going to happen. And I needed their buy-in before, because if we're gonna make this work, I need every single department working and aligning their resources and support and making little tiny tweaks along the way to make sure that all of those resources are directly supporting the model that we're going to implement. And so human resources was, was there. We had student placement there. We had transportation there. We had, um, I mean, anybody and everybody who's in our district. And I think that was really critical um, in starting this work because it's, it's hard work to do this and you don't need your own barriers in your own yard. So how can you take care of that up front so it's a lot easier along the road? So, so two points out of what you're saying. Um, when you're doing something like this, you're doing something different, and doing something different can be hard for a district. And sometimes folks on the outside don't appreciate exactly what you've got to go through on the inside mm -hmm. to pull something like that off and the amount of work. What, what was compelling about what 75 North came to you to talk about that, you know, that pushed you into doing that much work? Well, I, I think it was the opportunity for the kids. A lot of people ask why. Well, we were like, well, why not? Mm -hmm. We're not doing very well, and we have a proven model that was research-based, and if we're gonna do it, let's jump in with both feet and make it happen. And, and so that's, I think the main thing with the dist at the district level is educating your district, because when things need to happen, they need to be supportive. And so um, one thing that was helpful, as a district, we have a lot of systems and processes already in place that made the work easier, but it's also those same systems and processes that sometimes get in the way. Mm -hmm. And after educating the departments, and then if I needed something or the school needed something, then it was easier for me to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations or pull a group of my colleagues together to make that work happen. So it was easier for us to then tweak some of our processes to provide Kennedy with the resources, the people, and the time, and the money that they needed to make it happen. So, Catalina, I'm going to jump to you because Melissa will be uh, too modest to talk about this. Um, it sounds like, I mean, you get buy-in at this super high level, mm -hmm. and then you actually have to do the work. And what Melissa is describing without using the words is she was the champion yeah, that made sure. this happen. Yeah. So how does that work from well, your perspective? Well, I think two things when you were talking about this came to mind is that with our other work in other districts, what we see too is that there is often in urban public schools a turnover of superintendency. That's to be expected. But there's also a second layer of leadership that exists across most school districts we work with that are the Melissa's that have grown up through the system, could even have gone to Omaha Public Schools. Did you go to Omaha? And they have spent their whole career there. And so one of the key levers, I believe, is finding that, that 
second level of leadership and building the relationship there. Of course, you're building a relationship with the superintendent, but that second level is incredibly important because they wind up staying when the superintendency changes. So when you're looking for sustainability paths, I think that's Melissa. So one of the things that um, all school districts do is try to put systems, policies, and procedures in place so that your instructional practices are the strongest they can be. What Melissa had to do is say to, or help the school district see, yeah, Tony's not doing any of that, he's gonna do this. But what she did is not just replace, she showed the district how to integrate the best practices in the DREAM model into the existing structure. So a very concrete example of that is every school does a school, well, most schools do a school improvement plan. The district has a strong school improvement plan model. Rather than use the model, the bottom line is you need an improvement plan. And Melissa said, well, don't get caught up in that form and that the way we do it as a district. If this works better, do it. That might seem like an obvious, and that's a big deal in a, school dis a lot of school districts to change things of that nature. So I do think Greg's right that we, Melissa was the champion for the work, and you got to find that champion. So we talk about a quarterback. There's an internal district person that understands, buys into the model, and then kind of slays all the dragons that get in the way of the work and keeps the principal protected because he can't go back and say, yeah, we're not going to use that assessment tool. Purpose Boat wants us to use this assessment tool. Melissa comes up with the strategy on the district side to say, they're doing assessment. It's just going to look like this. So it's finding the similarity and the alignment between the district and the model, which is really what I think Melissa has done. Yeah, you know, and Catalina, you, you hit on something really important that um, at that district level, I don't have the proximity to all the district level people. So she was, she was my voice. You know, when, right. when we you know, work together and figure out how we're gonna make all this work and how we're gonna make it successful. I mean, we've, we had dialogue constantly um, just you know, thinking of ways of, of how, does this, how does this really align and what's the best practices. So, I mean, I, I would say, you know, with, without her leading that work in that charge, we wouldn't be sitting here today. Right. So you're saying she's the better boss. Is that <laughs> what you're saying? Yeah, I don't know what I would, I'm yeah. not a, yes. <laughs> yes, I, there you go. That's the right answer, Tony. You know, I'm a, hey. <laughs> So, all right, so let's say, did you want to jump in, Melissa? No, okay. no, I, <laughs> no I, I agree with uh, what Catalina said. Um, my role was frequently visiting and strategizing to ensure that um, the district department supported that we moved those barriers away so that we could actually do the work. And it was, it was a full-time job mm -hmm. sometimes, making sure, and, and you're thinking forward you're always having to make sure that you're five and ten steps ahead of other people and you have a complete plan because we had to be successful because if we weren't, the next time you come back, there might be more questions. Um, but it is critical to have somebody that is at the building. I spent time at the building, but I um, am located at central office. And so I think making sure that you're in both places so that you can represent the school and be the voice in an accurate way is important. So let's take things down to the school level uh, of the partnership. And uh, we're, we're talking as if this is effective and wonderful. You've been <laughs> underway for a year. What yeah. evidence do we have after a year that is, this is effective and wonderful? Yeah. You know, that year seems like an eternity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we did a lot of work. Uh, you know, our first year, I guess if we look at, um, you know, our definition of success, you know, we have to look at the data to kind of measure how we're doing. And, uh, you know, our first year, we, uh, we look at even our student behaviors. I mean, we had to change their mindset, change the culture of the building. And, you know, in the year prior to that, we had over 1,200 referrals, kids sent out of class to the office for, uh, for misbehaving. And we cut that down to around 200 referrals. Hmm. You know, so, I mean, that's a huge, huge jump down to where um, our kids are more focused on learning. But that also happens because some instructional practices change. Kids are more engaged, and that's reflective in, in our data. We do a, a state assessment every year, and with our math data, we had about a 9% gain in student achievement in math, and in science, about a 7% gain, uh, which is huge. And 3% is considered to be significant. 
And uh, this past year, we were awarded a, a gold award from the district. When a school shows uh, improvement uh, five percent or higher in two of uh, three categories, you know, we get recognized for our achievement. Um, and that you know that's that's huge um, accomplishments for our staff. I mean, teachers have the the most direct impact on on student achievement, and they worked hard. I mean, they worked really hard, and we really pushed them. So let's talk about what the purpose built schools educational consultants and its relationship to the school itself on an ongoing basis. And in a second, I'll put up the slide about the model. But Catalina, why don't you just lay out what, what that work, how do we work with the school? So in the most ideal set of circumstances, we have an opportunity to work one entire year prior to the school launching with the school leadership. So in the case of um, Tony, we had a, what we call principal residency, where the good folks at Drew allow us to come and literally learn in the building from the practitioners. What does it look like when we mean teacher collaboration? What does it look like when we mean um, autonomy for teachers? What does it really look like? And um, we worked with you one, at least one week a month. Mm -hmm. He would come to Atlanta and we would take residence in Drew and learn all the different aspects of the model. Our theory of action on this is that we, we do touch the teachers a bit, but our main focus is training the leaders who will implement the model and um, get them really well versed in the model so that they can work directly with their teachers. As the year goes on in the residency, it starts really with introducing the principal. Then we work with the district or the surrounding context. It could be school board, et cetera, to train them in the model. So that's Melissa and the folks. We identify a work team because this work is not one person's work, but a larger group. So we train that team, the district team, then we train Tony's leadership team, so the folks, the literacy directors, the math directors, the dean of culture, et cetera, get them trained. And then after the residency year, we move into the implementation year, in which it, it varies a bit, but pretty much we were on site last year about once a month, coming in to look at, um, we prioritize the model implementation. So we don't turn into Drew model in one year. We focus in the first year on the instructional programs in mathematics, social emotional learning, and literacy and early language development. So really what we call the tier one, getting that program really in place as well as the tier three, but that might be too specific. So That's okay. we well, implement. Let's see, and let's, let's let, so Tony, we're gonna put up a slide here. So on, on a daily basis, just walk folks through what you're doing that's slightly different than what might happen at a traditional OPS school. You know, when you see this slide, it's not something that's in concrete sequential order. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But I tell you the, the very top area of, of hiring, the, we, we had to kind of adapt and change our staffing structure in order to meet the needs of the model. So with that, we um, included deans at an elementary level. I think oh, but most let's, let's back up to be clear. Yes. So the staff, Last day of one school okay. year, there were certain staff. Yeah. First day of next yes. school year, talk to people All about right. the difference. So um, we, uh, we had something called a contract variance, which means that with our extended school day, which is one of the eight key elements, staff had a choice to either stay and apply and reapply for the jobs to work that extended school day or go to different schools. So I had a chance to basically rehire or hire new staff that's interested in working at our school. And you know, I worked with Melissa and the HR to, um, and even with 75 North to, um, you know, get the word out. I mean, they had a national, um, I guess, ad in the paper for people to come work at Howard Kennedy. Um, and with that whole process, we had to de develop that structure of hiring key people that's going to carry out some of those eight key elements. So, scale of one to ten, both of you, how important is it to be able to hire new staff like that, specifically with this model in mind? Extremely important. Uh, when, when you take a look at Kennedy before this partnership, um, the, the school, the culture, the academics, I mean, the staff were just surviving. And when your staff's surviving, your kids are surviving. And being able to allow that culture to leave 
but also give people an opportunity who still want to be there because the people that were there are great people mm -hmm. and they're doing well in other yep. schools. Um, but it just wasn't right for the culture and the, and the school and we had to give them an opportunity to leave but also give them an opportunity to reapply. I think we only kept about three staff, yep, two about three staff. two or three staff members. Yeah. Um, but it's extremely important because it's a cultural mind shift. It's it a mindset change. And if you don't have that mindset change, it's hard to move forward with the model. So that was extremely important. Um, we have a strong um, union in the Omaha Public Schools. And so it was important that when we had those monthly meetings for a year leading up to our board approving to do this model, the union was at the table. Mm -hmm. So they were very well aware of what was happening and we had their buy-in. So when it came down to say, hey, we're gonna do a contract variance because we're going to extend the day. Teachers are gonna have to reapply for their jobs to stay at Kennedy. They still have a job within the Omaha Public Schools. And so we needed their permission to write a contract variance. That's something we couldn't do on our own. So that relationship piece was critical in involving them in the process and the planning all along. And it was very easy. Something that would have been very difficult to do was extremely easy to sit down with our union and say, hey, let's draft this together. And it literally, literally was maybe two meetings, back and forth, we're good, signed. There were no questions asked. And so I just wanted to throw that piece yeah, in yeah. as you well. Know, you know, another piece of that is, you know, with this, hiring process, you know, our teachers, they're getting the same base salary as other teachers in other schools. So there's no compensation paid for working at Howard Kennedy except for the time for the extended school day. So that means that I had to make sure I find people that were running to something to be a part of something big beyond themselves versus running from something from the other schools trying to escape their current environment to work here. I mean, and that's, you know, we really work hard on um, designing a, a very um, strategic interview process with all that. Mm -hmm. And I can just kind of jump in here. Um, 75 North kind of latched arms with Kennedy and OPS around this hiring process because for us having really qualified, mm -hmm. eager, energetic, um, and passionate teachers was everything. And obviously the same went for the leaders of the schools, the dean, uh, the dean and, and Tony's position. Um, and so uh, for other you know, quarterbacks throughout um, the country, this is a, a really significant role you can play as an external supplement. Um, you know, we're, we're not o OPS um, employees, we're not working within the school, but you know, we're a resource to Tony, a sounding board, and with the hiring process, it was really key that we play a role there. So just some examples, we um, took Tony some of his deans and some prospective teachers out to you know really nice dinners to to get to know them better to um, kind of um, uh, get them familiar with with 75 North affiliation with the project what we were doing in the neighborhood um, some of the national um, marketing that we did and the the promotion 75 North kind of took that on um, as a financial resource um, to you know to ease that burden on on OPS and, and to Kennedy. And so, um, you know, even though we're not the ones actually hiring the folks, we did play a really integral role in that process. And, um, and for us, that was very important. Did, weren't 75 North representatives on the interview committee for Tony? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's another yeah. important. And they were also on the interview panel for the deans. And our district has deans in our secondary schools, our middle schools, and our high schools. And so that's, the dean position was new for elementary and so that in itself was took some conversations and communications with their human resources department because titles are directly connected to pay and so we needed these positions and we needed to call them something different actually at Drew they're called directors well a director in the Omaha Public Schools has a much higher salary than what yeah a director or a, the dean does in the Omaha Public Schools. So we had to be creative yeah. as far as, okay, here's the structure we need. What is it within the Omaha Public Schools? Mm -hmm. Don't tell me it won't work. Let's find a way for it to work because it will work and just be really creative. And so that's how we came up with the name of the dean position in the elementary schools. So Sydney, uh, to be clear to folks here, 75 North brought resources to the table in addition to that to make this partnership work. When you look right. at this model, there's a number of things that traditional public schools right. don't do. I mean, the extended day costs yeah. money, the early education. Yeah. You want to additional talk about staff, some of that? Yeah. 
So there's kind of like a, a baseline or a standard, and Melissa, Tony, correct me if I'm wrong, with OPS, the OPS funding for Kennedy is, you know, it's kind of standard. And so you're right, there are additional costs associated with the school now because of, there's a longer day and a longer school year is key to the model. Um, there's more staff to accommodate some changes in the school. So teachers now have teacher time. Two years ago, maybe when a teacher had a free period, he or she may have been assigned lunch duty or recess duty. Now that time is theirs to plan and prep for the day and, and the year. Um, there are resources around STEAM and, um, and science and math. And so, yes, there are, there's a higher cost associated with what's going on at Kennedy. Um, so 75 North in Omaha as a city is really fortunate to have a, a pretty generous, an, an exceptionally generous philanthropic community. Yeah. <laughs> um, many uh, are also public school advocates and specifically Omaha public school advocates. And so, yes, there were additional resources that were brought to the table to supplement uh, what is already going on at Kennedy, these kind of add-ons that um, are effective in Drew that we wanted to replicate at, at Howard Kennedy. And so that applies with the hiring process, but just kind of the day-to-day -day functions of the school. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, um, one of the, our, our local uh, philanthropists here has invested in OPS schools um, to, to help reduce um, um, mobility. Tony can talk about um, rates of mobility um, and with students at his school, you know, small circumstances can change a kid's yes. um, yeah, ability to get to the bus or now grandma takes you know the kid to school and, and so kids are changing schools for you know reasons that we think aren't that significant so there's been investments and resources being poured into kind of reduce that um, oh, Kennedy now has um, a social worker and a school psychologist these are all new resources that were brought to the table um, through external partners mm -hmm. That, that are um, both advocates of um, OPS as a district and then are supporters of 75 North. You know, can I talk about the yeah. extended day piece? It yep. keeps coming up. And that extended day um, has a tremendous impact on the professional learning that happens. So you look at the first key element, embedded, um, or actually the second one, embedded professional development. When Cindy's talk about the extra time during the day, we're a PLC school, so we do professional learning that's ongoing and we're looking at our practices each and every day, analyzing student data to help you know, change our practice to meet the needs of our kids. We have 47% um, of our kids are African American, and around 37% of our kids are Asian. And there's a language barrier uh, that happens and occurs. So our teachers have to you know, really adapt their instructional strategies and style to meet a very diverse you know, crowd of students to meet their needs on a daily basis. Uh, the other piece is the, um, the, the intervention piece. We talk about that, that tiered approach. We screen our students um, at the start of the year and three times a year. And we, that tier piece at tier three, our students are, are two grade levels below. And at a low performing school, you know, we had a lot of students who, who needed some extra support. So they get um, an extra 45 minutes, small groups in a, in a room with three adults that's focused on specific tasks and skill development that's going to help them close the gap of where they need to be. And that truly takes a lot of time. Uh, if a kid is two years below grade level, we're kind of spreading a marathon in a sense um, and trying to get them to an end goal really fast by giving them more time on task on specific skills each and every day. So we've got, uh, we've got about five minutes left before Q&A. What I want to do is just sort of go down this line here, give each of you 60 seconds. We've talked about a ton of different things that made a difference here, but the starting point was this is an effective partnership with a, with a public school district. What, what would be the one thing that you would highlight that has had the biggest impact on that partnership? And I'll, I'll ask for volunteers, yeah. Sydney. All right, yeah. right. Um, you know, for us, we'd probably say um, patience was really key for us. Um, our president and CEO can, can really talk to you about some of the challenges, some of those starts and stops that I mentioned. It was a, a process to get to, to, this, um, to this point. So, um, you know, we, we pushed on and, and we were patient. Um, the other thing I think is, is trust was important, um, that we were coming to the table with something um, um, significant um, and, and that was, had the ability to be life-changing for, for the community and um, especially the, the kids. 
Um, and so for us, that, those are kind of the, the key elements that, you know, that keep us going. Um, and, and I would say it's kind of the theme for us yeah. that we talked about. So patience, these things take a lot of time. Yeah. Um, three, four, five years, you've yeah. got to stick it out. And then trust, trust because at the end of the day, you're partners. About. And so you have to trust each other. Right. All right. Melissa? Mm -hmm. I would say the partnership, knowing that you have people there to support you, but you have to keep pushing. And um, that was my role, that advocate role, but keep pushing. I pushed Tony a lot, I pushed the school a lot, and then had a lot of conversations at the district, but also with purpose-built schools. So you just have to keep pushing your way through to keep the work moving forward. Yeah. And I guess I would re-characterize re that as a champion, and we talked about this, but you've just got to have a champion at that second level that you were talking about, Catalina, because at some point the bigwigs all say, okay, go get it done, and that's actually even harder than the first part of it. And uh, Melissa's too modest to say it, but it doesn't get any better than, than her as a champion. Tony? I would say um, surrounding yourself with all the right people and hiring the right people um, to get engaged with, with high capacity uh, you know, she talks about how she pushed me. I'm getting pushed around a lot. I, don't think about <laughs> I really push I mean, around. I, I do. I, I do. I mean, it's coming from all directions. But having a, a growth mindset and being transparent, and open, because uh, as a leader, I, I don't settle for less. I strive. I to. I want to keep pushing myself, and it it goes down to my staff. I don't expect for them to do anything that I won't do myself. Um, and we have to ha have the right people and build their capacity to make it all work. Yeah. Catalina? Well, time. I mean, I think time to me is that, that yeah. time and partners. So I'm always thinking about sustainability. So what's this, you know, to me, we didn't talk about, um, you know, building a team of champions. So just yeah. like when you're doing the revitalization in your neighborhood and you, I love when people talk about their story and they talk about the three people that met at this coffee shop. I would look for the Melissa times 10, right? You find the school board member, you find Melissa, you find the neighborhood partner, and I think the biggest lesson learned for me is that um, the openness on both sides. So yes, yeah. we have a model, you have a school district. At the end of the day, we just want kids to be really successful in school. So how do we bend and what role, like why, we often have had conversations of who's gotta be the bad guy in this one? Is it me that has to take the bullet or, just, and so the partnership look for, it doesn't have to only be in the education venue. Does that make sense? So find the people that are deeply committed in education as an issue in the community and bring them into the conversations. Uh, no, the only thing I would add to that, and then we'd like to take questions, is uh, as an outside partner, you have to be really well prepared to define what you're bringing to the yeah. table. You're asking the district to do something different, why? I mean, everyone wants better schools, but what are you going to do to help make that happen in this instance? And I think 75 North did a great job of articulating that and then following through on Thank that. Thank you. And, uh, and just to add, if anyone wants to, a copy of our community partnership agreement that's signed by Mark Evans that Melissa said was unanimously ap approved by our school board, talk to me after. I'm happy to email it to you. Yeah, we forgot the fact that there is an actual written There's document yet. here yes. that defines the people the that wrote it would not <laughs> yes. me would not be pleased to leave that out. But. All right. Well, great. Well, thank you all, and we'd love to now answer questions. And so, anybody, there's a microphone there. It may help if uh, we're happy if you if it's too hard to get to, yeah, we can repeat the question. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, I'm Allison Perry. I'm from St. Louis, and one of the things that kind of that I didn't parents or primary care givers for these children? Uh, so the, the question, I'm sorry, Allison, keep oh, going. Okay. Yeah, so just uh, if you couldn't hear, uh, Allison from St. Louis asked, how do we engage parents and guardians, primary caregivers in the daily work of the school? Knowing implicit in that is all of us understanding how important the family dynamic and support is. You know, I think um, all that engagement happened a long time ago when this whole idea was brought up, and for people to understand that this is something that we want to do with them and not to them, and knowing that you know early childhood um, is going to be a difference maker in the future, we can't serve every kid um, in early childhood in our community. There's a 900 student waiting list for kids who want, who need uh, that that additional support, but constant communication. Um, 
and inviting people in and just saying, you know, this, here's what we're trying to accomplish. Here's how we can support one another in making it happen. Because there's a lot of, um, you know, child care providers that are the grandmothers and grandfathers who are, you know, that's, that may be their income. And we're not trying to steal their kids away or take that away from them, but eventually they're going to end up in my school. So how can we, you know, support them and, and I don't think say I something quick? I'm not sure my question's been answered. I want to know, like, if, are there things happening at the school? Is there a program at the school? Engage yeah. the families and, mm -hmm. and, and, and for their own personal, you know, development. Yeah. As, you know, Parent parents, education. Parents, teachers, right. How do we get, you know, people to buy in? Because we know that once parents buy in, there's going to be a lot less transience. Let me say something. That, that's sort of yeah. So I, I want to back up a little bit because I think the first thing we have to recognize is we have to get kids in our school. And so if you take a look at the research for the National Association of Public Relations, um, it's not social media, it's not an advertisement in the paper, it's one-on-one -on -one conversations is the number one way to communicate, then it's a large group setting and a small group setting. So we were intentional about doing that. Hi, my name is Lashonda Leslie Smith. I'm the Executive Director of Connected Communities in Upstate New York, Rochester. And I'm curious, how do you discover who the Melissas are uh, <laughs> uh, within the district, particularly if you have a superintendent who is engaged in the conversation but not completely sold on the model just yet? We, just to give you a little bit of background, have had three superintendents in the last year and a half in Rochester. So we, there's a lot of turnover and there are people, we have some champions on our school board as well. But I guess my fear is if the superintendent is not 100% given into the model, how do the Melissa's of the world have the opportunity to be vocal about their acceptance of the approach? Well, I think it's important that you have a superintendent that is committed. Um, if you don't have one, how do you find me? You look at the district office, who is supporting and supervising your principals and schools? They're the ones who are most deeply connected to the school. They're personally and professionally responsible for the school, and so start there. Um, just like Purpose Built works with leaders in the schools, and then the leaders do the work with the students, that's the same thing that I do in my role. So find the people who supervise and support the buildings, that are working directly with the principals that are there in the building as well as at central office so they are living both lives and can actually support that work and make it happen because it is the system that makes it, makes it work. And so you need to have a specific person or position that is supervising principals and supporting them. Whether it's a principal supervisor, whether it's an executive director, assistant superintendent or whatever it may be, but you need to have somebody solely doing that position. So, all right, so I have an opinion on this, but I want to hear what you're saying. Can you, in your former position, could you ever have gotten this done without the explicit support of a superintendent and board? No, I mean, our superintendent's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, but, but, that, but you know what, though? Um, you know, there's always, yeah. you have to have a superintendent yeah. and board on board, um, but we also have a very good partnership with our community. And so our community um, is kind of like a lifeboat as well. Um, so there's, there's way it can, ways it can happen, but it's going to be more difficult. And I, I, part of the benefit we can give to y'all is just to be realistic about this, because I, I, I would be astonished if you can get something done yeah. without support there. It, it's, not a, it's not an either-or situation. It's an and, and, and. And you need all these things. And that's one of the reasons why you don't see this happen an amazing amount of times. Jenny from Grand Rapids. Uh, Melissa, I think I'm targeting you, but yeah. others can jump in. I'm curious when you started this conversation, if there was any pushback throughout the district of, well, like, why are. My work directly with Tony was to ensure that I built his capacity. And so the qualities that I looked for in somebody like Tony is one, somebody who is eager, enthusiastic, has great interpersonal skills, can learn is willing to put in hours and hours of work, and is willing to just give it his all. Um, this is hard work. There were many, many long hours that Tony, had to be, that Tony had to put in with his school, but also with me and Purpose Built Schools to make this happen. And he had to learn, yeah. because we were doing something different. Um, we had other innovative approaches in our district as well, 
but this one was still very unique. And so there wasn't, um, our district just has this, you know, with the new position, with my position coming on, there was this, just this big charge and energy to go in and support our lowest performing schools. And so we didn't have this competition piece. If anything, we were looking for more. And so just our superintendent just brings this great momentum that everybody follows and can continue. I, and I, and go ahead. Just really quick, I'll add, you can kind of look at our approach to Kennedy the way we've approached Highlander. Um, Highlander neighborhood is not the only neighborhood in Omaha that needs a lot of time and, and love and investment poured into it. We are one of many communities, but 75 North just does not have the capacity to take that on. And so central to the purpose-built model is this idea of a, of a chewable bite, a boundaried, you know, laser-focused neighborhood, you know, where, where you're, you know, pouring your, your time and your investment. The same applies with Howard Kennedy. You know, ideally with that, that 10 year marker that Catalina mentioned, we would love at that time for, for Kennedy to be a pilot and a model for um, a more expanded, um, this model throughout the district and mm -hmm. other elementary schools, but we have to get Kennedy right first. And so you're right, there's a, we're investing a lot of time and resources and money and all these things into Kennedy because we, we know we can get it right and once we do, uh, Kennedy will be a model throughout the city of Omaha and maybe the country. And I think just to put a fine point on that, it, it's a great practical question because what many of us bump up against in these conversations is, well, I can't do this at just one school. Yeah. We can't um, give one school that much attention. Part of the answer is there needs to be a macro environment where someone at the highest level can point to multiple things going on. So it's not just this one school. Even this one school may be a little bit more intensive. The other part of that is being able to articulate realistically how this is a model which then can translate to other schools down the road.